Hi, welcome to Spoiler Lab. On a whim, a king kept a giant flea as a pet, but it turned the life of his only daughter into a living hell. Today we will recap the 2015 movie The Tale of Tales. Here is the husband you chose for me. The film opens with the king and queen of the Valley of the Mist seated on their thrones, watching a troupe of artists perform. Despite everyone's cheers, Her Majesty watches the show with indifference. During another performance, one of the performers reveals her cloak and shows the audience her pregnant belly. This spectacle enrages the queen and she flees in tears to her chambers, where she trashes everything around her in anger. The king embraces his wife tenderly and apologizes to her for what has happened. He did not know that there was a pregnant girl in the troop who had unwittingly reminded the queen of her inability to conceive. Under the cover of night, a tall man in a black cloak arrives at the castle and calls the royal family for an audience. The stranger confidently declares that he will help the queen give birth to a child. He speaks vaguely of maintaining the balance in a world where every new life necessitates another's departure. The queen is not frightened by these words. I am prepared to die in order to feel life grow inside me. Convinced that the couple are willing to do whatever it takes to conceive a child, he finally tells them of the conditions. They must capture a sea monster in the lake and carve out its heart for the ritual. It must then be boiled by an innocent girl in complete isolation. After eating the cooked heart, the queen will become pregnant within the same hour. The royal couple look at each other worriedly, but agree to the bargain. The king cannot bear to see his beloved suffer any longer, so he himself decides to set out on a hunt for the beast. Putting on his swimming outfit, he dives beneath the water. At the very bottom he sees a huge white sea creature. It sleeps peacefully and does not notice how the king creeps closer and closer to it. The man draws his spear and pierces the beast with it. The sea monster howls in pain and starts thrashing chaotically from side to side. Because of the sand rising from the bottom, the king has no time to react and is badly wounded. The carcass of the sea monster is carried ashore and its heart is cut out. The king manages to fulfill his promise to his wife before he passes away. The queen comes to the lake and casts an unemotional glance at her husband. After all, his most precious possession is beside him, the monster's huge, beating heart, which will give her the long-awaited child. So the king gives up his life in exchange for a new one. But, as we shall see later, this does not mean that the balance in the world is completely restored. An innocent girl is found among the castle's kitchen staff, who is entrusted with the preparation of the magical dish. She dips the throbbing heart into a vat of boiling water and backs away frightened. Suddenly the girl begins to feel strange. As she unzips her clothes, she discovers that her belly is beginning to grow rapidly. The girl cries, realizing that a child is growing inside her. Later, the queen greedily eats the cooked heart, wishing more than anything else in the world that she could become pregnant. Fortunately, she finally succeeds and soon has a healthy baby boy. At the same time, the girl cook also gives birth to a son and names him Johan. The king's funeral takes place in the Valley of the Mists, and high-ranking guests from the neighboring kingdoms gather there. But the queen is not at all grieving for her husband, for all her attention is fixed on the newborn baby. Sixteen years have passed since these events. Her majesty is still obsessed with her son Elias and follows him wherever he goes. To get rid of his mother's obsessive stalking, the boy takes her to a labyrinth where she quickly gets lost. There, Elias also meets the cook's son Johan, who looks exactly like him. The boys are deeply drawn to each other and like to spend all their free time together. Their skin is pale and their hair is white, indicating their kinship with the sea monster. Plus, they have another unique feature, they can breathe underwater, hiding from the royal guards for hours. As you might have guessed by now, the queen does not like the boy's close relationship. She summons the cook to her house and threatens her with banishment if her son ever approaches the prince again. Elias becomes a witness to their quarrel and asks the queen to leave Johann's family alone, for he is like a brother to him. These words infuriate his mother and she forbids her son to associate with the bastard boy. Predictably, the boy disobeys her. One evening, the queen summons her son to help her put on her jewelry. The boy hesitantly enters his mother's chamber, gingerly taking the jewels in his hands. The woman notices her son's strange behavior and suspects that something is amiss. She sniffs the boy's scent and realizes that this is not her child. Johan leaves the queen's chambers and joyfully informs Elias that their prank was a success and his mother did not notice the switch. This news thrills the prince and he begins to fantasize about the fun they will have when he inherits the royal throne and they can take turns ruling the kingdom. Johan takes up the twins' idea and imagines giving a noble title to his mother and giving her a life in her own castle. However, the boys' conversation has been watched all along by the queen, who has no intention of allowing their dreams to come true. Before going to bed, she visits her son's chambers and reminds him of their unbreakable bond. The woman has waited many years for him and sacrificed her husband's life to give him life. Now she is not going to share her beloved boy with anyone. No one will ever love you like I do. 
At night, Elias escorts Johan to a secret passageway to the slaughterhouse, through which he secretly sneaks into the castle. There the queen is already waiting for him, intent on removing the boy who wants to steal her son's love. Fortunately, he manages to hide from the distraught queen among the carcasses of animals and thereby stay alive. This event, however, shows Johan that it is no longer safe to remain in the kingdom. To avoid putting his family in danger, the boy decides to leave the Valley of Mists and go on a journey. Elias notices his twin saying goodbye to his family and rushes to him to find out what is happening. Despite the prince's pleas to stay, Johan remains adamant. He asks his friend not to question him and to go on living his happy life. He pierces the trunk of an ancient tree with his knife, and a stream of water flows out of it. Johan tells his friend to visit the brook every day and watch its flow. If the water remains clear, it means all is well in his life. If it suddenly becomes cloudy, it means he is in danger. But if it dries up, you know that I too have reached my end. The boy leaves the kingdom, and Elias, as promised, visits the magical brook every day to check. One day he is horrified to notice that the water in the spring has become muddy and decides to go immediately in search of his twin. The prince's escape is reported to the queen and she goes into the woods trying to find her beloved son. However, he has already traveled too far and the queen has lost track of him. Time passes. Elias still cannot find his friend and wanders frustratedly through an unfamiliar city where his search has led him. Suddenly one of the local peasant women recognizes the boy and happily throws herself around his neck. Other villagers surround him and cheerfully welcome him, thinking he is Johan. It turns out that during his absence, the boy managed to start a family in this town, but a few days ago he went into the woods and disappeared without a trace. Meanwhile, the necromancer visits the queen again and offers her a new deal. If she so passionately wants her son back, she must make a sacrifice equal to that desire. The queen immediately agrees to fulfill any condition. The man smiles enigmatically, drawing her majesty along with him. At dawn, Elias sets out into the woods in search of his friend. He calls out Johan's name, but all he hears in response are the sounds of nature. Meanwhile his wounded twin is imprisoned inside the cave, unable to get out on his own. Through a small opening in the rock, he hears some movement outside and cries desperately for help. Suddenly a huge flying creature appears in the cave, intent on attacking Johan. The frightened boy climbs inside the opening, trying to escape the dangerous monster, but it manages to strike it in the leg. Elias arrives hearing his friend screams and covers him with his body. Upon seeing the prince, the monster freezes and gazes fondly into his eyes. Seizing the moment, Elias plunges a knife into the flying creature's heart and saves his twin. He helps his wounded brother back to his wife, and he heads home to the castle. At this point, we see that the queen was disguised as the monster, who gave her life to find her son and look at him one last time. Thus the balance in the world was finally restored. The king gave his life for the birth of Elias, and the queen, in a twist of fate, sacrificed herself as a means to save Johan. With this story, the film shows us several of the deadly sins that govern the queen simultaneously, sloth and greed. Perhaps this tale would have had a very different ending if Her Majesty had not been so eager to command her son's heart. Now let's look into the neighboring kingdom, located in Lone Cliff. The king in this tale is also obsessed, but his obsession is with excessive lust. He leads a promiscuous lifestyle and is constantly surrounded by women who satisfy all his whims. However, he cannot find a special girl who is worthy of becoming his queen. One day, on his way back to his castle after yet another prodigal night, he hears a beautiful woman's voice humming a melodious song. Fascinated by what he hears, the king looks out of the window, expecting to see a beautiful girl. Licking his lips with anticipation, the ruler tries to seduce the stranger in order to possess her as quickly as possible. But she hides her face and hurries back to her house. The enigmatic girl further excites the lustful king's imagination, and he decides to win her affections by all means. He sends a messenger to the peasant woman's house to present her with a precious necklace as a token of his deep interest. The woman prefers not to go out and the servant leaves the gift in a bucket that serves as a letterbox. Upon receiving the necklace, the girl finally shows us her face. Despite her beautiful voice, she turns out to be old and ugly. The woman's name is Dora and she lives with her sister Ima, who is just as ugly. The sisters hardly ever leave the house, ashamed of their appearance. When Ima sees the luxurious necklace, she offers to give it back to the king. But, after trying on the jewel, Dora refuses and assures her sister that they are more beautiful wearing it. The woman is pleased by this attention and decides to keep the necklace, not yet knowing the tragic consequences. At night, the king arrives at the door of their house in person. Addressing the beautiful stranger, the excited monarch showers her with compliments and says he is ready to thank her generously if she will let him see her. Dora listens avidly to the king's sweet speeches as she moves closer to the door. The peasant woman's silence begins to make the man angry, and he impatiently demands to be let inside. Open up this door, let me in. Let me see you for damn sake. Ima tries to stop her sister from messing around with the monarch, 
But Dora has no intention of passing up her chance to get rich. To keep her identity a secret, the woman devises a cunning plan. She asks the king to return to her in a week and then she will present him with a tiny part of her body that shows off her beauty, her finger. The man likes the stranger's inaccessibility and agrees to wait. For the entire week that follows, Dora tries to find a way to rejuvenate her wrinkled finger. She dips it in burning wax and dabs it with medicinal herbs, but it gets even uglier. The frustrated woman does not notice how a week passes during these activities and the king's velvet voice echoes again at her door. The man demands that the peasant woman immediately fulfill the promise she has made. Dora begins to panic, but suddenly she notices her sister's smooth finger. She has often been licking it as she works around the house, which has helped her keep it looking young. Grabbing Ima's hand, the peasant woman forcibly pushes her finger through a small hole in the door. The king greedily kisses it, enjoying its beauty. But this is not enough and he demands that the girl be fully revealed to him. This would seem to be the time to reveal her secret, but Dora decides to go all in. She agrees to fulfill the king's wish, but on one condition. I be welcomed into your bed in the darkness of the night without any candles. Excited, the monarch agrees to the peasant woman's request. The next day Ima helps her sister glue her wrinkled body to resemble the figure of a young girl to the touch. As night falls, Dora heads to the castle, hiding her body under a blanket. In complete darkness the old woman reaches the king's chambers and spends a passionate night with him. At dawn, the curious monarch decides to light a candle and examine the face of the sleeping beauty. To his surprise, instead of the beautiful girl, he finds an ugly and wrinkled old woman in his bed. Horrified, the king jumps out of bed and calls the guards to his chambers. Dora tries to apologize to the monarch, but the man is deaf to her pleas. Suppressing an urge to throw up, he orders the deceitful woman to be thrown out of the window. Fortunately, Dora manages to survive, having caught her cover on the branches of the trees. Fortune smiles on the woman once more and she is discovered in the woods by a wandering sorceress. Laughing to her heart's content at the comic spectacle, the woman helps Dora to her feet. She feels pity for the poor old woman and embraces her, comforting and putting her to sleep. The sorceress leaves, and Dora transforms from an ugly old woman into a beautiful girl with long, fiery red hair. In order to forget the unpleasant incident of the morning, the king decides to go on a boar hunt. Among the trees in the forest he discovers a naked girl of angelic beauty. The man instantly falls in love with the beautiful stranger and decides to make her his queen. After a while, the king's servant comes to the sister's house, handing Ima a beautiful outfit and an invitation to the royal wedding. The puzzled old lady arrives at the castle, where she is met by the astonished looks of the guests. The king and queen appear in the ceremonial hall, accepting congratulations on the wedding. Noticing her sister among the guests, young Dora takes her to another room and reveals her identity. Ima cannot believe her eyes, mesmerized by her sister's beautiful face. Dora promises her a rich life, for she is now a queen. After the ball, Ima does not wish to return home, so she sneaks into the queen's chambers. The old woman begs Dora to let her stay, for she is so tired of being alone and misses her sister. But Dora orders her to leave the castle, for no one will believe they are sisters. Then Ima insistently tries to learn her sister's secret so that she, too, can find youth and beauty. Dora tries to convince Ima that she does not know how it happened, but, losing patience, she replies with a sneer that all of her skin was peeled off and so she was transformed into a beauty. Suddenly footsteps are heard from outside, and Dora hides Ima behind a screen to prevent anyone from seeing her. The king enters to make love to his queen. Ima cannot endure it and, out of curiosity, comes out from behind the screen. The monarch notices her and becomes hysterical. Experiencing horrible flashbacks, he orders the old woman to be thrown out into the street. In the morning, the desperate Ima comes to the blacksmith and asks him for a favor. Could you change my skin? She decides that this is her only way to find beauty and stay with her sister in the castle. At first the man is shocked by the old woman's request, but agrees to comply when she offers to give him jewels in return. He places Ima in his chariot and drives her deep into the woods. On the way, the old woman cheerfully dangles her feet in anticipation. Having sharpened his weapon, the blacksmith proceeds to remove the skin. The forest is rattled with screams of agony. After a while, the mutilated Ima returns to the town in a half-dead state. She later passes away, never regaining her youth. However, her sister's beauty does not last forever either. At that moment, at a celebration in the kingdom of the Wild Mountain, the magic cast by the sorceress begins to dissipate. Upon discovering that she is becoming an old woman again, Dora escapes from the castle. In this tale, the main characters were possessed by lust, pride, and envy. Perhaps if Dora had not become arrogant about her new status, she would not have lost her sister and her youth. The monarch of the Kingdom of the Wild Mountain sits on his throne, listening to his daughter Violetta musical performance. The young girl's talents do not particularly interest the king, and he is easily distracted by a flea he discovers on his arm. 
The tiny parasite jumps from one palm to the other, amusing the man with its tricks. Barely waiting for his daughter to finish singing, the king takes the amusing flea to his chambers. There, he feeds his new pet some red fluid from his finger and places it in a transparent container. Obsessed with the idea of making the flea his pet, the man makes toys for it and teaches it new tricks, completely forgetting his royal duties. Meanwhile, Violetta dreams of having the romantic relationship she has read so much about in love novels. During a meal, she tries to convince her father to find her a good husband, but he has no intention of parting with his only daughter. Violetta loses her appetite, and the king happily feeds the half-eaten piece of meat to the growing flea, affectionately stroking her wrinkled skin. Then one night the king summons the court physician to his chambers. Lying on the floor is the flea the size of a giant pig. The disturbed monarch asks the physician to help his pet, who has suddenly begun to suffocate. Stunned by the sight, the doctor examines the sickly insect, but fails to save it. The grief-stricken king embraces his passed away pet and asks the doctor to keep his secret. The next day, the monarch presents Violetta with beautiful outfits and informs her that he agrees to find a groom for her. However, the man decides to go for a new folly and offers to select the chosen one through a special tournament. He hangs up the flea skin in the throne room and promises to marry off his only daughter to the man who can guess which animal it came from. The suitors proceed with the contest, but none of them can recognize the beast. Violetta watches excitedly and is upset when the handsome prince fails the test. Unexpectedly, it's the turn of an ugly giant. The girl gives her father a frightened look, but he insists that the orc take part in the contest as well. Thanks to his excellent sense of smell, the giant easily recognizes the huge flea by its scent. The king looks at his daughter in confusion and apologizes to her, for he was sure that no one would be able to figure out the mysterious animal. Violetta flees to the roof in tears, intending to part with her life to avoid marrying the ogre. The monarch catches up with her and tells her that he cannot break his promise and that his daughter must obey his will. In the end, the girl agrees to the horrible marriage, but makes it clear to her father that he will regret his decision. Fear not. Your obligations shall be respected. No one will be able to say that the king did not keep to his word. The giant forcefully drags the poor girl after him, foiling her attempts to escape. After placing the princess on his shoulders, he carries her to the top of a cliff, where his shelter is located. What she sees inside the cave leaves Violetta shocked. The floor is covered with human remains. Sad about her terrible fate, the girl spends the rest of the day among the rocks. The cannibal takes the princess back to the cave and takes her by force. One day, when the giant is out hunting, Violetta sees a woman on another slope gathering herbs. She tells her of her terrible situation and begs for her help. Taking pity on the young princess, the woman promises to return to her with help. After spending another day with the ogre, the girl loses all hope of salvation. But the woman's entire family comes to her aid, which turns out to be wandering acrobats. The most handsome and youngest of the sons uses a rope to carry Violetta to the other side of the gorge. Hearing strange sounds, the giant rushes after his wife. But the fugitive manages to make it to the other side. The giant gets very close to her, but the eldest son manages to cut the rope, as a result of which the giant falls into the abyss. The acrobat carriage transports the merry company onwards. The younger son shows the princess tricks with fire, causing her to laugh with glee. Suddenly they are attacked by the giant, who has managed to survive the fall. He brutally slaughters the head of the family and the eldest son. Terrified, Violetta takes a knife from her fruit basket and escapes into the woods with the rest of the group. The enraged ogre goes after them in pursuit. The fugitives try to hide in a ravine, but the ogre finds them by their scent. The youngest son makes a desperate attempt to escape and releases flames into the monster's face. Screaming in pain and fury, the giant lunges at the boy and breaks his neck. The same fate befalls the mother of the family, who has agreed to help the young princess. In despair, Violetta tries to flee from her pursuer, but the giant quickly finds her. He calms down and orders his wife to climb on his back so that they may return home. The girl obediently complies with the ogre's demand, convincing him that she will not run away again. But, seizing the moment, she cold-bloodedly slits her horrible husband's throat with a sharp knife. At the castle, the king is feeling ill because of his terrible deed. Suddenly the servants burst into his chambers and excitedly announce that Violetta has returned home. The king immediately runs to his daughter, but stops in shock when he sees what has become of her. His once smiling, kind girl appears before him exhausted and covered from head to toe in red. She shows her father the severed head of the ogre, summarizing her marriage. The repentant king falls to his knees and begs Violetta for forgiveness. Time passes. The kingdom of the wild mountain celebrates Violetta's coronation with guests from the valley of mists and lonely cliff. Accepting congratulations, the young queen gazes up at the sky, where a daring acrobat crosses a fiery rope. What sins do you think lurked in the last story? Write in the comments which fairy tale impressed you most and don't forget to like this video.